All right. So I'm here with Pat and Todd of Chapel Farms out here in McMinnville outside of Portland, Oregon. Yeah, so we're here uh, at our insect farm. We're raising black soldier fly, taking organic waste in the community and kind of broadly in agriculture. Kind of how do you repurpose that using these nature-based solutions? And this one happens to be centered around insects. Let's check everything out, right? Sounds good. All right. Thanks for having us, Pat. I'm really excited to uh, talk about um, what y'all are doing here today. Um, I guess you can just kind of give us a little bit of like why Black Soldier Fly, why Chapel, and, and what's what's the um, motivation for, for doing all this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so kind of the, the thought process leading up to it was natural resource management. Just mm -hmm. looking at food, agriculture, water, how are we maintaining that? How are we interacting with these resources needed for that over time? You know, how are we setting up the next generations? Yeah. There's some major challenges ahead of you know, future generations in terms of how we're managing our natural resources that go into feeding each other and the water that we drink and the air that we breathe. There's a lot of consistent of dialogue about uh, more nature-based solutions and how do we facilitate this more kind of interactively and integrate these systems kind of contrary to how we've been growing food for the past several decades. The opportunity to kind of look at insects and see how that can kind of weaves into the broader landscape of agriculture seemed like it was really solving some of these foundational challenges that we have ahead of us. I started the company 10 years ago, and really that's been the, the goal of the company is welcome insects back into the landscape of food production at the scale of how we're growing food now today and how we're managing wastes that come out of our food production and agriculture production and how we distribute food to people. You know, massive amounts of wastes and inefficiencies that, you know, nature has <laughs> figured out how to eliminate and create that circularity for you know, well before we came onto the into the fold. You know, early on, we were really trying to raise awareness about the viability of insect agriculture, insect farming. And so now as that awareness has grown, there seems to be you know, big momentum all over the world, you know, lots of companies starting up. And so it, it's growing. And at this point, what's really needed is that supply chain help facilitate that growth and that kind of marriage between waste management, food production, soil management, the insects are clear winners in. They are keystone variables to healthy functioning ecosystems. You know, that organic material falls to the ground and then insects take work. over they're champions at that level creating healthy soil microbiome for the soil providing healthy nutrients and fats to other trophic layers of animals insects just make sense when nature eats predominantly insects we're focused on the black soldier fly larva because they're saprophytic and that means they consume rotting decaying material you know that's their natural food source they're a great waste management tool and then beyond that they're incredible nutritional profile for for fish and chickens and um, and then their frass is incredible uh, at, at facilitating soil health and they're really kind of can help usher in that biodiversity in, in many different layers of it you're painting like a really big picture of like the sustainability of resource management going forward and waste piling up and now these insects are kind of connecting that gap but beyond even just like livestock feed and everything like actually you're talking like yeah. reversing what what uh, the current trends are they're incredible examples of how to do it in a circular way and so we're trying to have our business model facilitate that circularity so it's not just focusing on it extracting these nutrients to go at one animal feed and kind of that linear part of the puzzle is there but it's a circle and so it has to be treated as such and we have to have more life. We need more insects, more biodiversity within plant communities, within animal communities, within insects communities, within soil. So we're, we're trying to have this be just a real champion of a lot of those kind of directional changes that we want to see. All right, so uh, this is the first step, right? All the feedstock comes in. Um, I guess could you tell us like first, where does it where does it come from? And we got a couple different sources in yeah, here. Yeah, so, so this is our from? research and innovation center. So we're looking at a lot of different feedstocks to support our projects all over the U.S. So for example, here we have some ground grape pumice from Oregon. And this is after the wine pressing yeah. process. There's yeah, it's very dry. To, yeah. And so we ran that through the hammer mill already. We put a little treatment on that. And so we have ground pumice there. We have ground malting barley for the brewery process here. Uh, this came from Washington. We have some ethanol distiller grains from North Dakota we're looking at. Pretty much any organic spent waste stream that's okay. out there. We can mix up a diet that's ideal for the bugs and feed it to them. 
like, so I don't imagine they're not showing up in these bins, right? So, uh, how, like, how do you coordinate that with the wherever this food waste is coming from? Are they showing up with like a big dump truck and you're uh, sifting it down in these bins, or how's that? We work? usually start with a smaller process, um, a benchtop trial, and so as part of our project development process, as we find a site, as we find waste streams in an area, we decide we want to maybe build a, a bug factory, black soldier fly factory. We then find those feedstocks in the area, start talking to the providers about what they're currently doing with their waste stream, how much it costs them to get rid of yeah. it. And we bring in a sample of it. We do nutritional testing okay, on yeah. it, and then we mix up some smaller trays to see how the bugs like it. It makes the most sense to have the insects eat it where it's being produced. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do is model kind of the nutritional part of it here, and then actually building I the see. colony around it. It's going to be built. It doesn't make sense to be moving these and waste yeah. and byproducts all over the country. So Okay, so you've got multiple types here because this is the research place, but once this starts moving- we build on site. Yeah, it's gonna yes. be like yeah. one or two of these yeah. for the whole yeah. setup. And then the, uh, somewhere else is gonna have a different different kind of waste stream. It's a base, exactly. it's a base ingredient okay. for a okay. really healthy nutrition kind of package that we try and create. What, um, what are um, they doing right now for um, their waste streams? The ethanol spent grains are getting dried down and most of them get shipped out of country or at least out of state as cattle feed, animal feed. Wine pumice is an issue right now. Recology in Oregon can only take so much before it gums up their composters. A lot of people just apply it to fields out here, um, put it in their compost piles, but it doesn't break down as quick. The spent grains right now, Astoria, Oregon, that area where they have a bunch of big breweries, it's overloading their wastewater system right now for the breweries to be dumping. And so they were looking for an alternative, and that's another one where we could feed it to our bugs, keep it out of our supply systems, okay, and not stress the city, and yeah, the county supply. So they don't. It seems like no one really quite has an answer for it, and the the kind of de facto move has been just kind of pile it, spread it somewhere, pile, but now give it to it's a cat, too deep. animal feeds, exactly. Yeah, it's too much of it, and so that's where this comes in. Okay, so so what's the next part after um. After this, after um, after we receive season. feedstocks, then we move up to particle size reduction and, okay. and mixing diets. And the goal here is basically to bring it down to a size and a diet that is ideal for feeding to the black soldier fly. So they start off as pretty small juveniles. They have small mouths. We need to reduce particle size so that they can actually consume it. And then they prefer a certain moisture level to help it move through their system, you know. So do you find like you're supplementing humidity or usually trying to remove moisture in the feed? We're trying to find a balance to get, you know, up to a higher moisture percentage, above 70% moisture. And so if we have dry feeds, we want to find a wet feed coming from a spent grain process or something that then can bring the total balance up to something that's more ideal. Okay. The, the, yeah. Those wet those wet waste streams are fairly problematic. So they're yeah. either kind of transported at high cost or there's a lot of energy going into drying them and yeah. figuring out something. So when they can eat them wet, it's pretty advantageous from just a nutrient management perspective. So that's one benefit is that they like a fairly wet feed Okay. And yeah. from an energy standpoint, the ethanol distillers don't have to then dry down their spent grains. They yeah. can ship it wet right next door right? to it's, us. Well, yeah, it's, it's either the, the high shipping cost because it's just weight. Yep. Or, um, or the high or, yeah, energy cost. The energy, energy cost of drying it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, so, that's super cool. We're also, we're not just creating the food for them. It's also their home. So we, we put that in a bin. And so they live in that environment, the feed. So the we put that kind of feedstock into a tray and that's they eat it and they live in it okay. so a lot of so this is making size kind of, and structural integrity are important yeah, and so, well. so after it's, yeah. so what happens here is like it's just it's just being processed at different so particle size you're saying you're just you're yeah. just shredding things so smaller. this is our shredder and this is if we have like corn cobs or something big the shredder can break it down to a general particle size and then it gets fed up the conveyor into our grinder which really rips it apart and okay. grinds it down nice. smaller so and then eventually is, it's ending up in... It falls into one of these mixing carts, which this is just like a big, you know, mixing cart like you'd have in a bakery. It just can roll around and we have a pumping tube to make it easier to fill. But yeah, it's just a big okay. mixing blade in here. And so all we're doing is homogenizing and then getting it all, all okay. mixed together. And this is a step where we'd usually add water if we need more. Okay. And then pump into trays. Making it smaller, making it smaller, homogenizing, wetting it, pumping it into these trays, which we'll see later. Yep. Look at the exactly. Right. All right, so here we are in the uh, insect grow room. You want to give us a quick orientation to what we see here? 
Yeah, the, we have the whole insect life cycle in this room of the black soldier fly. So the flies lay the eggs, we grow the eggs into neonates, then neonates into larva, larva pupate into flies, and the whole process starts again. And so this is, just pick any point on that circle, but this is our nursery. These are our neonates. Todd can kind of walk you through kind of the different stages. Yeah, so this is our nursery tub. They're sitting in a nursery diet right now. So we take the eggs, weigh them, dose them out so that they're the right size in this tub to be dosed into one of our larger trays. And these are the trays we'll use at the factory scale level. We'll just have a lot more of them. So nursery feed, nursery tub into the feed that we just mixed outside. So this, this feed is different for the first part of their life? Yes, correct. Yeah, they like a different moisture level, a different texture level in order to be able to move through it. And okay. It's baby food for the larva, basically. Okay, exactly. sweet. Yeah. Fly baby food, we move from that, we dose it to our trays, and then they eat in here for seven to 10 days. And so you can see the writhing mass up top right here. They like just a week to go from neonate to what, like almost inch or so? Yeah, about 0.25 grams, 0.3 grams roughly. Wow. Cool. They double in weight each day through those seven days as they grow. and They eat their, all of that feedstock we showed you, they eat all of that in this phase right here. And that tray, that's the only time and they eat 100% of that if you do your upstream processing right. And that's just what leaves two proce products. But then they don't eat in the next phase, in the fly stage. So they're accumulating all that energy for later in life. And so this period of time is, you know, eight days, they're rapidly consuming all that wow. yeah. to really store eight, that. Eight days to, to eat everything you're gonna eat in your entire life. <laughs> okay, about, about how much uh, does one of these weighs do you think? Probably about a hundred pounds. Yeah. So it's movable with a couple people. We also have a forklift to move them around, but as you can see, we have them on wheels. So yeah. we can slide them in and out and weigh them as necessary. It seems like there are a lot more neonate bins than there are grow out bins. That's part of where we're at in our research cycle right now. We're trying a couple different breeding methods to see what our yields are. So we, okay. yeah, you're right. We have quite a few more neonate tubs, but these can also store for a few weeks and we're burning through these one week at a time. Okay. So we can kind of build up a mass, work through them over a couple weeks and then, okay. and then rebuild up another mass. So you're trying to see like if you can grow them faster through the neonate stage? Faster and just a uh, total amount of grams of neonates per cage is the number we're trying to figure out right now. Because okay. then that tells us how many cages we need to process X amount of tonnage of feedstock coming in. After they've eaten here for gorge themselves for a week, um, they begin to pupate. And exactly. So we actually have an example right here. Mm -hmm. So you can see they become black and hard and hold still and their tails start to curl. And so this is when they're getting ready to pupate and move to the fly state and they hatch out of here like a cocoon almost. Yeah, we've got some empty shells. And, and so as they get closer to where we see they're ready to hatch, we put these white trays into the breeding cages in, and then they start to emerge and you can see the flies. Right. Um, and of course, so you're spinning out these grubs as products, so, but you do need some to continue the breeding process. About how much, what's that look like? Five to 10%. So you're, well, you're, saving, you're saving about five to 10% of these to continue the cycle, and then you're harvesting like 90 plus percent of the grubs out into that post-processing that we saw. Yep. Further into the food chain. Yes. Yep. yes. Okay, so here we are at the breeding stage. Uh, what, what all the eating was about. Um, so yeah, I guess, can you just walk us through this um, net of flies? Yeah, so all the eating was to save up energy so you can come in here and mate. And so this is where we have our breeding cage. We load, you know, roughly five kilograms of pupae in here. And in seven to 10 days, they start to emerge. And that's when you start to see them mating and connecting in here. And then three, four days later, they'll start to lay eggs. So you can see we have a few different devices in here to help capture a place for them to put their ovipositor and deposit eggs so that we can then collect those and hatch neonates out of them. Right, yeah, you're, you're trying to focus where they're laying because we are trying to control this process, right? And right. so we're not just having them grow willy-nilly, we've had every life stage spaced out. Have you had any uh, difficulties like um, focusing or, or, or kind of like controlling where they're laying their eggs? Definitely, I mean, they wanna lay in dark places near where they know a food source is. So in nature, they'd like implant into bark near a tree where there might be rotting fruit underneath the tree so as that their babies hatch, they can fall and have a food source right away. And so we put an attractant in here to try to attract them to this area to say, this is a good place to lay. But we still find them in the corners of the cages. Like you can even see some up there right now, some eggs they've deposited. We find them in their pupae shells and back. We find them in the dead flies. 
So they will lay eggs all over the place, but our goal is to try to catch as many of those as we can and try to attract them to lay in one place as best as we can. Is there, has there been any um, growing pains or hurdles in trying to um, reach successful mating? Increasing fecundity, right? Just how many eggs you're getting out of uh, all these adults? Of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I asked because I knew there would be problems, yeah. so yeah. yeah. All of this is, I mean, insect farming is pretty old, you know, in terms of humans and, and how long we've been doing this, but at the scale we're doing this in kind of this phase, this is some new territory that we're all figuring out kind of together. And so that breeding piece is a, is a challenging piece. And kind of like farming, broadly speaking, there's part art, part science, and always learning through <laughs> failures and, and catastrophes. And that, that's baked into all of this. But certainly breeding in particular has been a challenge for you know, the industry and, and how do you really kind of you know, manage a kind of healthy process as well as kind of have that flow into other processes of what we're trying to do at other life stages. In my limited experience on a non-commercial level, uh, achieving successful breeding was a real hurdle because that finally let me get neonates and continue the experiment and process. So I, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, um, about your experience maybe bridging that gap when you didn't have a complete life cycle and you were still trying to um, make it so that you were uh, not having to buy in, I guess, uh, grubs all the time. I mean, it's decades in development, you know, it, more than a decade in development. Um, you know, a lot, we, we try to do a really collaborative process in learning. And so you know, a lot of people have been doing this around the world and kind of figuring out little things here and there. And so it's been this kind of evolution of, of learning of how to do that. I mean, it's a very specialized process, no matter what kind of animal farming you're doing. In humans, it's a very specialized process, yeah. that birthing process. And so it is a very, kind of, it requires an expertise and a lot of experience in that kind of, you know, job growth, that career path in and of itself. It's a very, kind of becoming a very specialized field. And yeah. we got lucky, our main black soldier fly entomologist technologist in South Africa I think his specialty is breeding. He helped with some of these breeding lights, kind of the light cycle they like to increase production. He's helped develop some of the different attractants and egg traps to catch them. And he has decades of experience there. So he's the one who is really telling me what to look out for, what to watch. But in the meantime, there's always gonna be, you're building up a facility, you don't have time to produce eggs yet. And that's when we rely on our university partners, people like that, that we know are producing neos and we can buy them in to get the colony going to start. And then once our equipment's ready, then we can pick up our breeding ourselves. I'm seeing it a lot more like clean and simpler than some of the other things I've seen around. Like uh, there's been a lot of things about like, oh, you can, you can feed them sugar water and you, can, you have to play, play music or give them some kind of vibration. And, and it seems like kind of cut, cut that away. And, a bit. We do water our cages every day. They will survive if they don't have water, but they're just a little more productive because even though they don't have mouths to eat at the adult stage, they still have a straw to drink water. And so we do come and water the cages, you know, to keep them hydrated and keep them happy. But we are trying to minimize contact, minimize disturbance. If we could move away from having attractants inside so we don't have to reach inside the cage but can still harvest, that would be ideal. And so we're constantly experimenting with different methods here of how it, 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 there's also more precision than it looks to the uh, climate control system in here. You know, we're constantly learning, of course, but it's very, you know, fairly precise uh, that you can't just kind of. Yeah. Well, so, so the precision is outside of this net, I guess, like, cause there's, I'm not, yeah, definitely. I don't definitely don't mean to suggest that like you could just throw this together. No, no, right? But that's the, that's when you make it look easy. That's when right? you're doing it right. Yeah, you're yeah. Doing, <laughs> exactly. You're doing it right. It's clean. It looks, it looks easy, but there's a, you know, you found a few very particular things. And really what we're trying to do here is quantify. We're doing a lot of data tracking. How many days does it take them to get to this cycle? How much production are we getting at this stage? If we adjust this, then what does it do? And so we're constantly tracking that data through the different cycles and trying to find that sweet spot that we can then just replicate at in the larger factory. I think that, I think we saw a little bit of that. Uh, is that what's in the, the little mini greenhouse out yeah, in the warehouse? Correct. Yep, Science. we got moisture analysis. We've got our very precise scales so we can weigh our tiny neonates and larvae. And yeah, we're tracking a lot of the data there. All right, so uh, grow room finished. We just uh, move on to post-processing, right? Yeah. All right, let's go take a look. 
All right, so we did all the pre-processing, uh, making everything smaller and homogenous and to the right amount of moisture. The bugs have fed on it and it's coming out. So what's, what's happening now? What gets poured into here and, and how do we move from, from, uh, from the feed area? Yeah, so at this point, the bugs have ate through all the feedstock and we're left with a pretty fat, protein-rich, fat-rich larva mm -hmm. and then their frass. And ideally at this state, it's no longer sticky and it's easily siftable. And we dump the trays into here and then we load them up and the screen sister sifts based on particle size and that'll separate the larva from the frass so that we have two separate products that we can then dry and sell. Okay, so everything's been poured into here. It goes up through this conveyor belt and then into this large sifter, right? Which Correct, yep. So this is a swing sifter and it has multiple screen sizes going from different levels down. And you can see the tubes here for outlet feed. So basically bigger particle sizes will get caught on the top screen, fall out of this tube, smaller ones will fall out of these two tubes. And so this separates our frass from our larva at this state. And then we have two distinctive separate products that we can then take on to whatever form of post-processing we wanna do. Awesome, okay. So it came in as, as just food waste, and now at this point, we now, like you said, we have, you've got your two products. This is what it took. We did the pre-processing, the grow out, mm -hmm. post-processing. And then so just a little bit of product refinement. Is that right? A little bit of product refinement. I mean, we want to be energy conscious and we would love to sell whole live wet larva uh, and avoid the drying step because it's one of our biggest energy uses at the large facility. But right now, FDA requires us to be dried below 10%. And so, yeah. We have a rotary drum dryer that we can then dry both of them down to make them shelf stable and transportable. And then if we choose to press beyond that, we have an oil press where we can separate the lipids from the proteins. And both those have their own separate markets they can be sold into. I'd imagine uh, the drying is also pretty key for um, like shelf stability and being able to actually transport them because um, those, those live grubs, like they don't stay very long, right? Uh, as we'll see in there, like once they're uh, mature, they're looking to pupate. And kind of keep moving because they're alive. Exactly. Yeah, it, it, it only works in a real tight circle, kind of in that capacity. Just like you're trying to find local feed waste, ideally, right, as local feed possible. waste, turn it in uh, to this uh, insect feed, and then hopefully, like, ideally it would be just give it right back out to local. Exactly, local yeah. Consumers. yeah. All right, so we got a wall of uh, different products here. Can you uh, take me through at least some of them? I know, um, like, okay, let's start with this one. Um, the, where did this oil fat come from? Sure, yeah. Well, let's start with this one. How okay. This? Yeah, so these are these are the larvae themselves. So this is what they look like after harvest and then you know, we dry them out. And so another, then from there, this is a really kind of whole foods, complete package of really healthy fat, really healthy protein, and chitin has some extra beneficial um, health, health benefits to it as well. And so, but you can separate those. And so you can separate the fat okay. and there's, you know, tremendous applications to the, the larva, the, the lipid profile. Um, and then when you have the, when you separate the oil and separate the fat, then you're left with a more protein dense powder as well. And so there's applications for the protein powder and right now, aqua feed so yeah. trout salmon you know that we in the united states we have regulatory approval for diets containing black soldier fly meal for some on it awesome. uh for poultry exciting. yeah exactly poultry yeah, well, and dog yeah. food because well um that happens kind of recently right yes it's been in the last five years yeah. yep Yep, all of it. Okay. This is all in development. So the markets, the product development, the regulatory of approval, it's all coming. It's all kind of we're building all of it as we go here. Um, but those were, you know, landmark things to help help Actually, facilitate. Yeah, the growth open of up the a industry. potential yeah. market. Yeah. Because up until that point, insects were seen as a feed contaminant. And now we finally have like that yeah. approval for insects to be the feed. That's right. That's right. Um, so not only do we focus on balancing the nutritional feed going into the insects, but then also you've talked about the nutritional profile of the insects yeah. for whatever's feeding on them. Yeah, so a, a lot of kind of our farming of fish, that's the aquaculture is the fastest growing food production system on the planet right now. Wow. And a lot of that feed going into it comes from ocean caught fish meal. Mm -hmm. So herring, anchovies, and you know, incredibly nutritious for fish you know predatory fish that yeah. they eat that in the wild 
but you know, in their juvenile stages, they eat insects. And so this is a really complementary and kind of way to augment that growth, you know, to help facilitate kind of a healthier diet for these trout and the salmon that were already growing. Um, and the amino acid profile is fairly similar to fish meal. And so we're looking at, you know, as a globe, how can we, you know, we're not growing any more anchovy. We're not growing yeah. any more you know, yeah. herring. Right. Yeah, it's, it's healthier for them. And then it's also like giving them something more natural and it's it's avoiding either the corn and soy that's just destroying the land or the fish meal that's destroying the ocean and instead we're just like oh we're taking food waste and, yeah. and making something natural for you yeah yeah it's we're just trying to <laughs> yeah we're just trying to figure it all out you know as we go but there's there's been a lot of unintended consequences to how we've been growing food um uh, yeah and uh it's just not going to continue and we can't set up future generations with the way it is right now it's just it's not going to work for them um so we have to we have to fix this and then we also received regulatory approval for dog food and so these are dog biscuits that have black soldier fly protein powder in them as well cool. and what we're seeing is you know all these other health benefits that um associated with their gut microbiome and they're a lot less um they're a lot more resistant to diseases. Kind of same thing with chickens, with fish, and so okay. there's all these so added health benefits. Yeah, it's kind of like it's giving them a non-industrial diet, kind of the same as this move for yeah. humans as well, and your micro gut kind. Exactly. Home. Yeah. It, yeah, we're seeing in other animals, it's it's actually replacing antibiotics going into feeds. So there's, it's like, yo, man, there's all these downstream. When you do it more in a circle, just conceptually, there's all of these multiple benefits that you see just kind of at each piece. But, you know, the more you, the more you can make it linear of, okay, we are a protein production facility, you're going to have more externalities. But when you try to connect all the pieces and have this be more of a circular process and business model, I, I, we're trying to minimize our own internal internal externalities, if yeah. you will, and have those be beneficial to the communities around us, and supply chains around us, and you know, commercial partners. Be smoother because it's holistic from the start and hope, you know, like um, fixing problems or not making problems for yourself to have to fix later. Like the antibiotics, it's like we had to apply antibiotics because they had poor health. It's like if we yeah. just start with good health, then we'd you know, prevention versus curing. Yeah, it's, I think it's smoother in the long run. Yeah. <laughs> if we make it harder on ourselves often in the short term, you know, making things more complicated, that's not necessarily how you want to have a growing business. You know, you're not, you not. You want it to be simple just for efficiency's sake. But when you have a long-term focus of how to solve some problems, then you need to be a systems thinker, I think. I guess what, what are the most, like, popular products of, of the... You've got a, several different ways to break them down. What are... What's... Yeah, I, I, you know, it's... It, I'm always blown away at how many people have chickens in their backyard in the United States. It's, it's pretty large. I think last number was like 30 million chickens wow. You know, wow. out of commercial production. And so that's, and, and it's growing. And a lot comes from people kind of wanting a little more transparency in their own food system. They want to eat eggs that they knew what the chicken was eating. Um, and so this really fits well. And so these go into one pound bags and people buy them and feed their chickens at home as kind of a healthy snack. And they can see the results yeah. with a darker, healthier yeah. yolk. You know, it's like, like it's almost like uh, letting your chickens free range, even if they aren't, because yeah, you're, that, you're bringing the insects to them. That's one major benefit of free range is the amount of insects that go in their diet. Yeah, and and then the other product that we right, haven't talked about is yeah. So when if we do our our job right in the beginning, we make all that food small enough for them to eat the larvae to eat and consume it entirely. Then we are left with a zero waste process where they've okay. eaten everything and processed that into frass. So there's not a lot of residual leftover because food scraps you've done the pre yeah like because said, the we pre made it so that they could digest it all yeah okay um, then you're left with this really, with really just valuable frass. frass yep and so that's all of their excrement as well as their exoskeletons as they um move from instar to instar and so in the the screen sifter so you're just like i said you're just separating frass from from larvae from larvae yeah and so and this no, goes and no waste product like you said um yep 
Interesting, yeah. Uh, when I was messing around with it, it was like I had spent, br spent brewer's grains, but I didn't process them. And so, yeah, they ate the, the grain, but around around the shell was yep. all left and had to separate that out in addition to everything else. So. Yeah. yeah, if they can't eat it, they'll eat around it. You know? Okay. So this so, is yeah. kind of making everything edible. And then this goes, this is, uh, goes right back into the soil. So this is a really healthy soil amendment. It has all sorts of biostimulant properties. Um, help you know plants develop secondary metabolites and things like uh, flavonoids in tomatoes. You know they yeah. taste better. There's yeah. more fruit production. It's kind of greener leaves, and there's all these benefits to just a healthier plant and cool. plant agriculture. Is it being from. is it being applied as like like dry grant dry or trying to are people like making teas out of it or I don't both. know what yeah both yeah okay. yeah because okay. the microbes are very important so you can you can make a tea out of it and it can go into more of a hydroponic system or you can just apply it in its dry form and, and have that be land applied yeah. neat i like yeah i think it's it's just really neat uh just to see um how important that pre-processing was because like i said like that uh the waste from the food waste uh was a real problem yep. for me and it's really neat to see yeah that you've just you've not only don't deal with the problem, but you've more wholly just turned it into the product as well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Let's get let's get that plant material that created that yeah. waste. Let's get it back in the yeah. soil quickly. Yeah. What are some things you think um, could help, like just uh, the agricultural workforce in in preparing for um, what will hopefully be the new uh, entry of of insects into the into widespread use. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of information that you can do self learning, um, and so this it's in development right now. You know, we've we have we've had an internship program, but what we're we're trying to foster, you know, like, got this new career path, if you will, as well. And so uh, there's plenty of outlets, and there seems to be more and more curriculum and content available. So the opportunities for self education within insect agriculture are kind of readily available, and we're trying to increase and augment and facilitate that as well. So uh, advice is start looking at what's already out there. You know, a lot of DIY, spend some time on YouTube and you'll learn quite a bit about Black Soldier Fly. For the people that you're hiring here, um, what are like some of the skills that you were looking for for them to bring in? Yeah, I, I remember speaking to the entomology department at University of Arizona that the kind of professors were lamenting that the career paths for entomologists were kind of pesticide development, like how do you just kill them at a widespread or kind of academia, and then very few niches within that. So I think we're trying to slot into that niche of entomology and okay. biology that helps kind of usher in this new category of insect farming, you know, in a holistic okay. way. And so it's, it's kind of a new avenue of, of farming and, and science and biology yeah. and entomology and microbiology. Okay, so if you're, if you're interested in insects, not looking to kill them with pesticides left uh, just all over the place and um not looking to just be a professor you know kind of trying to open up this world of like insect husbandry yeah i don't mean just a professor not just a I just mean yeah. that's I mean, a like, limited outlet yeah, yeah if you want to be a professor if you want to <laughs> yeah, be a yeah. pesticide applicator yeah, it was yeah. a binary choice and now you're trying to offer yeah. a third option primarily yeah cool. exactly exciting yeah. yeah so do you have anything else that you'd like to tell us that we haven't uh covered today or that you want to just make sure to get mentioned? Yeah, yeah, so we, you know, we, we're trying to hire and we're trying to grow, and we're trying to work with student groups, you know, at kind of multiple levels of education and, but we're always open to kind of collaboration, especially with the community kind of at large. So come to our website, you know, chat with us, ask yeah. us questions, we're, we're here, we'd love to, to answer questions, help educate and kind of, we're, we're here as a part of the community. Okay, awesome. All right. Thanks for joining me on that uh, tour through to pull farms. Lots of uh, tiny things contained inside that uh, big building.